welcome to Greece, welcome to Thessaloniki. As you can see, I work here in the Aristotle University, I live here, so I will welcome you in Greek as well. Kalimera, kalus irthate. To make myself clear, this um, presentation addresses to people who don't speak any Greek at all, or who, <laughs> who would like to, to learn the, the basic sounds. Huh? How, how do we start learning a language? First, by communicating it, and second, we are interested in being able to read the signs, at least, and um, the letters, how the letters are read and pronounced correctly. So, uh, what I decided to present to you today is the first lesson of modern Greek that we teach to our foreign students at the School of Modern Greek Language in Aristotle University. So before I, st I start with the lesson or the game, whatever you can characterize it afterwards, um, I'd like to say a few things about the courses and the um, institution where I work. The School of Modern Greek Language uh, operates within the Faculty of Philosophy of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, which is the biggest university of Greece. And it offers courses of modern Greek to foreign adults, students of the Aristotle University, visitor students via exchange programs, as the Erasmus Plus program, and foreign residents of Greece, as long as they hold a secondary education certificate. So the uh, presupposition is that they are over 17 or 18, and they have a secondary education certificate from their country, whatever country, whatever language is their mother language. Uh, we design tailor-made courses for Greek for, of Greek for specific purposes, and recently online courses as well. And apart from language courses, we offer a rich cultural program, folk dance lessons, cooking seminars, guided visits to the city's monuments, cultures, cultural excursions, and so on. There are also educational seminars to teachers of Greek as a second and foreign language. And of course, the institution participates to the university's research programs. The audience of our language game, or our, our first lesson of modern Greek, are Erasmus Plus students attending lectures at various faculties of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. They are at the beginner's level, A1, the course is intensive and it is offered twice a year at the beginning of each semester and it has a maximum duration of 40 hours. The problem. The usual introduction to the phonetics of modern Greek in course books uh, follows the alphabetical order. That is, phonemes of modern Greek are presented according to their position of its representation, i.e. letter in the Greek alphabet. The emphasis is being given on reading, that is, priority to teaching the correct pronunciation of letters rather than corresponding the phonemes to the target language of the target language to their written representations. There are pros and cons of this method. The, m the major advantage is that beginners get the impression of starting from zero which may reduce anxiety feelings when learning a foreign language at its natural environment. And let me ask you here, how did you start learning, if you all speak more than two, three, four languages, how, d how do you usually start learning a language? Do you take it from alpha? Uh, do, you, do you learn the alphabet first? Hmm? That, oh, sometimes. Hmm? There are other ways as well. Huh? You, you travel to the country and you start speaking with people. Yes, but usually if you follow um, an instituted lesson, they usually take you from alpha, right? Um, however, this method uh, may have some disadvantages as well. Students starting from alpha, they lack the whole picture of the phonetics of modern Greek, which may be particularly confusing if they already know or speak any ancient Greek, because the phonetical system is not the same anymore uh, between the two languages. And all diphthongs appear as exceptions in modern Greek according to their original old pronunciation, whereas they can be better understood in the synchronic phonetic system of the language. That's why we have come up 
with an alternative presentation of the first les lesson. And the basic idea behind this guessing game is that it meets the need of another type of introduction to the phonetics of modern Greek instead of following the historical alphabetical order. And in terms of uh, methodology, methodology of teaching, uh, this addresses more communicative teaching methods rather than the traditional method starting from the alphabet. Also, it takes advantage of universal language knowledge, that is international scientific vocabulary and popular trademarks based on Greek words. And finally, it overcomes obstacles of meaning during the first stressful contact of learners with a foreign language. Greek words in European languages are originated in ancient Greek, were transmitted to the European languages through Latin, as you all know, as morphological and uh, mostly as semantic loans. They apply to various semantic territories, such as medicine, mathematics, philosophy, politics, arts, sports, etc. And some of the examples from English language, um, Greek originated words, anatomy, epileptic, symptom, diameter, etc., etc. Those words are called internationalisms. And according to one of the, uh, one of the scholars who has um, spoken about them, they appear in more than one languages who have common written and or phonetic form and belong to the same semantic field. They usually are of classical origin and they should be distinguished from modern Greek uh, that is what uh, Professor Petrunias has, uh, call, has described as international Greek. And international Greek is one of the sources of the vocabulary of modern Greek as well, of course, but also of other languages other from modern Greek. A few examples and then I'll end up with my theoretical part. Modern words originally created in European languages whose lexical basis belongs to ancient Greek. In Greek now, my examples, cardiologia, psychologia, chilometro, telefono, ecologia, utopia, and others. Sometimes they combine both Greek and Latin elements. The word kinoniologia, sociol sociology, uh, Latin, socius, and logia, Greek. And egoismos, the Greek root ego, and the Latin ending, ismos. They re-entered the Greek language mostly during the 19th century through friends, and they belong nowadays to common knowledge as part of the international scientific vocabulary or as trademarks invented for marketing purposes. There are a few reservations in using them during our teaching, and mostly because there are phonological and morphological differences of these words in different languages, which may cause interference problem to foreign learners of modern Greek, in particular to foreign classicists like you. However, teaching experience in the School of Modern Greek Language has shown that the semantic proximity of these words is an important element, especially at the beginner's level. Therefore, obstacles of meanings are reduced and learners' investment in the target language is importantly increased. Okay, now I'll start with the game as I teach my first students of Greek. And usually my first question is, how much Greek do you know in lesson one? They usually tell me no Greek at all. Maybe this is not the truth, but they are too stressed to admit that they can read some of the letters, some of the signs, or they can read in Greek, etc. So we start with a common uh, admission that it is all Greek to the students, huh? that they start from zero. And then I present them this slide and I read 12, I pronounce 12 words in Greek. And I ask them to match the sound that they hear with the icon. Let's do it like in class then. I'll pronounce the words in random order and you have to decide which icon I refer to each time. 
I always pronounce them twice, so the first time will be um, self-training, <laughs> and the second time you will give me the right answer. Yes? <coughs> what, um, what icon? The last one, masks. Huh? These are masks, okay. Yeah, they, they will get more clear once we find the right answer. <laughs> So I start with my first one, which is half done for them, telefono, and it's quite easy to recognize. And then photographos, cardiologia, arithmetiki, musiki, aroma, oxygono, evro, idea. Aeroplano, Theatro. Did you find them all? <laughs> okay. L let's check. Telefono, which is obviously this. And then I pronounced photographos. And then I pronounced cardiologia. Where should I go? Mm-hmm, up. And usually uh, we use words in Greek, pano, mesi, kato, and the numbers. Ena, dio, tria, tessera. So, cardiologia, pano, ena. Right? And then, if I remember well, I pronounced arithmetiki. Where would you take me now? Messi? Tessera, right? Messi, tessera. I could have said also avacas, but that's a rare word. Not many people know it. So arithmetiki is um, more common. Or even mathematica. And then I pronounced um, oxygono. Messi, ena. Oxygono. Idea, pano y cato, cato, cato dio. You see, it becomes more clear once we <laughs> find the right answer. Evro, pano, dio. Aroma. Cato tria. Che aeroplano. Mm -hmm. Pano tessera. E pano dexia. Mm -hmm. If you know the. Or if I want to teach the students also directions. Aristera dexia. Pano dexia. Musiki. Messi dio, ωραία, και θέατρο, κάτω, κάτω δεξιά, ή μάσκες. And there's one more I missed, I'm not sure I even pronounced this, <laughs> μικροσκόπιο ή μικροβιολόγος. Messi και τρία. So the first part of the guessing game was an acoustic game that meant to strengthen their self, how to say that, the, um, the self-esteem, that they, they can understand more Greek than they suppose in Greek. And then we move on to the Greek alphabet because the written representation of the letters is important. It is important for them to be able to recognize the printed letters. So I presented this icon and I ask, how many letters can you already recognize? From Latin alphabet, from your own experience, from living in Greece so far, etc. So how many letters can you already recognize? 
from the Cyrillic, exactly. Mm -hmm. I guess letter alpha is something that they can all recognize. And after they give me the familiar letters, then we move on to the strange letters, the letters that look unfamiliar. What would you answer? Usually they point me or they describe the letters, uh, the one that has two bellies. <laughs> and it is in the middle there, huh? letter Xi. And there is another one with just one belly, hmm? the Zeta letter. And also some letters are familiar from mathematics. Hmm? Can you recognize a few in here? P, okay, P in Greek, he, mm -hmm. and sigma, yes, that means the sum up. Okay. And then I will start presenting each letter, or to be more concrete, each sound, because this is basically a phonetical, a sound representation. And I start with the vowel sounds, and the vowel sounds are easy in modern Greek because we only have five distinct vowel sounds, unlike ancient Greek and unlike many modern languages. So the vowel system is quite a clear system according to the position of uh, pronunciation in the mouth. And this is what my schema represents, the mouth and where each sound is pronounced in the mouth. So we have frontal vowels, like E, O. We have back vowels, like O, U. And a, a, and a vowel that it is back, but needs the mouth open, A. Can you repeat after me? E, E, U, O, A. Quite basic, isn't it? What is not so obvious is how these sounds are represented in the written system. With the sound A, ah, there is no problem at all. What's the representation of A? Ah? Alpha, letter alpha. With the sound of E, we have two different representations. We have letter epsilon, and we have a combination of letter, an old diphthong that is not a diphthong anymore. Hmm? Diphthong means two voices, two different sounds. So this used to be an I, but nowadays it is E. And what's totally crazy is what happens with the sound E, because here we have five there is a sixth one, but it is not so common in modern Greek, so we decided not to use it here. Uh, five different representations of the E sound. What is important for our students to understand is that all these representations have the same, absolutely the same sound, E. The question that naturally arises is what? Why? <laughs> Why do you have so many E's? <laughs> and I'm always happy to explain this question, but maybe as polyglots you can explain it uh, instead of me this, this time. Hmm? What do you think? Why do we have so many E's in modern Greek? For? Simply from ancient Greek? Okay, but we're not ancient people anymore. <laughs> so what's the use of keeping uh, the, the way that they... Um, it's the position in the word, of course. Yes? It's a grammar issue and also? Etymology. Etymology, yes. Yeah, the, the meanings, the roots of the words. It is etymology. Hmm? Uh, we have kept this for historical reasons. Hmm? We have kept the historical spelling. Uh, there have been voices every now and then that we simplify uh, language and we keep only one or two E's, that we get rid of the old diphthongs. Uh, but this is, uh, this is not an easy decision and not a decision to be made from one person. 
So um, Greek scholars, the Greek Academy, um, for ages has decided to keep the historical, the old spelling. This may give learners a hard time because it is really hard to remember and to know the roots of the words. But on the other hand, the more advanced you become in learning Greek, you find out that this actually helps you because you can connect words with others. Uh, you can form your own uh, semantic families and it helps you understand and learn more vocabulary eventually, gradually. The representation of the O sound is double, Omicron and Omega. And what does Omicron mean? Micron, small, huh? Mega, big one. Actually, it was short and long when the difference existed. Nowadays, there is no difference at all. But micron used to mean the short O, and omega was the long O, the double O. O, the verbs, the verbal O. And the O sound nowadays is represented by two letters. Unlike in Old Greek, that we had one letter, in Modern Greek we have two letters. Anybody knows already what two letters? Yeah, draw it for me, please, on the air. Exactly, yeah. O and Y. Y is one of the E's nowadays. So a very common mistake to foreign learners of Modern Greek is that they read this Y letter as U. Modern Greek uses the Y for E, so the U sound needs another representation. And here it is, Omicron Y. I'll give you examples of each one of them coming of this big group of international Greek. The reason is obvious, so that we don't have to deal with meaning, just with pronunciation. So how would you pronounce the first word that you, I'm sure you all know what it means? Analysis. Quite similar to the pronunciation in other languages, isn't it? Some words have a similar pronunciation and some words are different. Some of them are even unrecognizable. But this is a good practice, a good exercise to get used to the modern Greek sounds, which is our goal in this case. What about the A's example? Energia, energia, and the second? Egeo. Mm -hmm. This is a geographical term. Did you recognize what it refers to, Egeo? It's the Aegean, yeah, the Aegean Sea, Egeo. Yes, please. On the second, energia. Hmm? Did, <laughs> maybe I was trying to emphasize the word, and I. Yeah, but I, the, the correct stress is on e, energia. And that is a good observation because we need the foreign students to get used to the stresses from lesson one. Hmm? Uh, the, the stress is important in modern Greek. Yes. I Which lives too. <laughs> Do you know that this old rule is still valid? Uh, and it is very important in modern Greek as well. Mm? That the stress can only fall in one of the last three syllables. So you have 30% chance to, to do it correctly. <laughs> Let's try the E's now. Any volunteer? Historia. Historia. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, can you try the fourth word again, please? Icona. Now you said it correctly. So I repeat. Historia, ilios, hipothesis, icona, economia. Are all these words familiar? Even if your Greek is still basic? 
What about the O's? Oasi, Oceanos. And the U? I didn't give it. <laughs> Utopia. This is an interesting word coming originally from Aristophanes, the birds. Utopos, a place that doesn't exist. But it re entered the Greek language quite recently. It is not a word that the Greeks were always speaking of. It is a philosophical, it entered as a philosophical word nowadays. I move on to the consonants, which I present in phonetical clusters, according to the articulation place in the mouth again. So I start with the labials, hilika, the ones that are pronounced here, with the help of our lips. P, V, F, B. Quite similar, but still different. P, V, F, B. So the sound P in Greek, you know this from maths, is the letter P. And the example is ready right away. What word? Panikos. V. This is letter Vita, which is not a B in modern Greek. It is V. Viologia. Do you understand now why, I, why we chose to present them in clusters? Because Vita, V, should not be mixed with the B sound that will come right afterwards. Whereas if I present my alphabet in the right order, then I don't have the B sound at all in the Greek alphabet because the B sound is a double representation. So, viologia and the next F. Fantasia, fantasia. And here I come to my B sound or mb, as the Greeks prefer to pronounce. Mm -hmm. So, our word would be emborio. Mm -hmm. Emborio. In the middle of the word, this combination is pronounced mb. In the beginning of the word, it would be b. Sorry? Boris. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Babas. So if it's in, in the beginning of the word, it's a clearer b sound. If it's in the middle of the word, it is mb. Emborio. Sorry, I didn't listen. Ah, the word video. Mm -hmm. NT. Yeah, I'll come to the NT in the next cluster. Okay. The NT is a dental sound. Hmm? Fantasia. Okay. Yeah, it, it is already there. Yes. My last example in the, on this slide will be the D sound. Knee and taf. Okay. The dentals, t, z, s, d. The first one, t, tragodia. Can you, pro can you repeat? Tragodia. Tragodia. Mm -hmm. Here, one of the first corrections we do to English or German speakers is do not aspire after t. Mm -hmm. The Greek t, no, this was not a Greek t. <laughs> this was an English, a German, whatever t, but the Greek sound is t, t, tragodia, without the aspiration. Hmm? What's the meaning of tragodia? Tragedy, hmm? tragodia, tragedy. Next. Demokratia. This one. Theatro. And what about this? Antibiotico. This is not a very common word, but doctors, pharmacists will recognize it. Hmm? Do you recognize it from your own language? No. Antibiotico. So, not biotic, huh? Biotico. Because 
this after vita, as we said, it is just e, antibiotico. My next group will be velars and palatals. Different pronunciations, but the same letter in the Greek alphabet. So pronunciation k and q is the same letter in Greek. What letter? Kappa. So kappa can be pronounced as ka, cardiologia, and can also be pronounced as kia, like kinikos. The rule is that when we have a frontal uh, vowel, e or o, then we palatalize. Ki, ke. When we have a back vowel, I remind you of the trapezium schema, when we have a back vowel, then we choose the velar pronunciation. Ka, ko, ku. The same goes on for with the rest of the sounds that I have on this cluster. Can you try this? Gastronomia. Mm -hmm. Do you realize the meaning of this word? Gastronomia. Huh? It has to do with food. <laughs> and what about this? Ye. Geografia. So what we're interested in here is that the first gamma we pronounce ga and the second syllable ye. Ga, ye. It is, on it is the last one that it will arrive, which I repeat myself, we would have missed if I only presented you the 24 letters. Chaos, chimia. Chimia, is it recognizable, this word? Chemistry. And the strong sound is g or ng. Combination of letters again. Gazi, angelos. So both gamma kappa and gamma gamma can be pronounced as g or ng. But it is obvious that we don't start the word with gamma gamma. Mm? All words starting with this sound should start with ga, gamma kappa. Nasal sounds, m and n. Metro. What about this? N nostalgia. Liquids. Logiki. Rhythmos. Rhythmos. S and Z sounds, alveolas. Systema. Here we have a third representation, the final sigma, the old Byzantine sigma, only at the end of the word. And for zeta, zoologia. Double letters, double pronunciation, x and ps, so xenophobia. And one more, psychologia. There comes practice, exercise for the students. We ask them to put the words in the correct place according to the bold letters. So what we're interested in is the pronunciation of specific letters here. Um, so obviously on the alpha sound, I'll put analysis. On A sound, energia, and what else maybe? Egeo. Of course, there are many words that have the A sound inside. That's why we only stick on the bold letters. And here is the consonant part of the exercise. Again, I've been using words that I used in the examples before and words that become in the international vocabulary. Similarly, I could take advantage of Greek names. Greek names are easily recognizable if you live in Greece or if you have Greek friends or Greek family uh, back home. And 
it is also the same advantage that our students can bring up some of the knowledge they already have just by meeting with Greek people or walking on the streets. These are words and names that are easy to be heard and understood if you live in Greece at least 10 days. Okay. And another idea is to use geographical terms, countries' names, cities' names from all over the world, preferably from the students' places of origin. So, for example, what would you put in the sound k here? Ne, Croatia. And in the sound ps, the last one? Yes, some people said that. Lipsia, do you recognize Lipsia? Leipzig, yeah, Leipzig in Germany. Mm -hmm. So, if we had time to do this properly, like in class, um, it would be a really guessing game for some of the cities and the towns. Not everything is obvious, but it's a good way to start. And then they always present what about the alpha, they, they always ask what about the alphabet then, the 24 letters. Well, here they come, the 24 letters, their name, the sound, and the examples we have used so far. In a more advanced level, or according to the audience, I may use this table that in the example part, it is the lexical unit or the prefix that we use to form languages. And in that case, I would ask them to form languages using the prefixes, the lexical units. It depends on who the audience is. I'm sure you can meet this challenge perfectly well as polyglots. <laughs> so what would you say about um, ideo? Uh, could you form any word in starting from ideo? Uh -huh. First you start with your own language. Eh? You, you, you try to think if in the languages that I know there is a word starting with ideo. What I need as an answer here is a guessing of how would that word be in Greek, in modern Greek. So if you already know ideology, then it's not hard to guess what? Ideologia, exactly. So this is the goal. We need students to be able to pronounce their first words in Greek. And peri, there are many words starting with peri. Ne? Perimeno. <laughs> From um, geometry, perimeter, okay, in Greek, any idea? Perimetros, eh? if you remember the metro that I used before, metro, metro, perimetros. Okay, and now I come to the last part of this guessing game, which is the most fun of all. Uh, words that we all know, lexis puoli xerume, borite na mandepsete, can you guess? the word behind, actually the brand behind the word, and then the word behind the brand. Let's see. By now you should be able to pronounce these Greek words correctly. You know the alphabets, you know the combinations. So in Greek you should pronounce Niki. <laughs> well, this is an urban myth, everybody knows this, that's why I started. I chose to start my game with this, because people know that behind Nike it is Nike. But let's see if you know the rest. What about this? Pepsi. If you pronounce correctly, then you come up out with the brand as it is in the original idea. What's the connection of them? What does it it mean Pepsi. It does mean something. <laughs> yeah, it has to do with the digestion. So Pepsi means digestion in modern Greek. So it is a product that helps you digest, or supposed to help you digest. Yes? In Psi? 
Mm -hmm. This letter, the third letter, the third P, has P inside. Pepsi. Okay. What about this? IKEA. The furniture. And if you happen to know that IKEA means what? House. Then it is easier to make the connection. Hmm? A company that sells things for the house. What about this? Yes? Emporio. Emporio. Actually, it is an identical word from the Italian cloth industry. This brand uh, that uses the same word, Emporio. Hmm? And do you recognize the brand? Do you, do you know the series? This is the cheapest, the cheaper of the Armani. Because em Emporio means commerce. So this is the commercial series. The one that maybe everyday people could buy. What about this? Oreo. <laughs> the cookies. What does it mean, Oreo? Right. Actually, it means the, the, the Greek word behind the Oreo is ora. What is ora? Ti ora ine, posi ora echo. So, Oreo comes from ora. And philosophy of language, old, old Greek people, <laughs> ancient Greek people, used to believe that everything in time is proper, is right. So the old meaning of oreo is in time, proper, right. And we use this word very often nowadays to mean what? Nice, good, well, orea. Yes? We, yeah, it... Uh huh. Yes, it is. The aspiration has disappeared from modern Greek language, and I'm not sure if the people who thought about this brand <laughs> knew Oreo. <laughs> uh, but it makes sense. Hmm? It could be the Greek word or even the French word "or," uh, the the gold. Hmm? I actually I googled it where it comes from, and there is no answer. So I. Um, I chose to put it in the presentation to teach this word, ora, oreo, and a cookie is always something pleasant, especially when it comes in the right time. <laughs> what about this? Asteri. Uh, to help you, I'll guide you towards uh, a comic strip hero. Asterix. Hmm? And it means what, Asteri? Star. Mm -hmm. So he's the star of the series, isn't he? Do you recognize him? Do you know him? Yeah. yeah. And now we'll do the other way around. I'll give you the brand. This is harder. And you'll try to guess the Greek word after the brand. Klinik. Ne? Klinikos. If, if, you, if you are doctor, if doctors are around, or if you studied to become a doctor, you may know kliniki, clinical. Kliniki comes from klini, which means bed. And that's why in the hospital clinic, it's a place where there are beds for the, um, uh, <laughs> for the people who need them, for patients, yes. And this cosmet cosmetology product, uh, actually the, the marketers behind this cosmetology product decided to make the connection with something very clinical, very hospitalized or very research like in hospitals. So something to be trusted to use on your face. What about this perfume? I used the word before as an example. Ego is this. Mm -hmm. Not a very good idea to advertise a perfume for selfish people, but still. And again, perfume industry seems to love Greek originated words. Ephoria, almost as you see it written in the Latin alphabet, the uh, transwriting in the Greek alphabet is very similar. Ephoria, and it means what? <sighs> nice feeling. Huh? So, oh, anything that starts with F means nice. What about this? 
Idolo. Here we have to use the other E, not the obvious Yota, but the Epsilon Yota, again for historical reasons, and Omega. The students cannot know this, of course, but here is where the teacher comes to explain. That's a tricky one. Can you pronounce this in, in English or French? I think it comes from French, the brand. Antilios, huh? Antilios. Can you, can you guess, can you understand what the product is? Sunscreen. Helios, huh? sun, and anti means what? Against, contra, okay. So it is against the sun or to protect you from the sun. And the Greek word that we use nowadays is this. Andiliako. This is the word for sunscreen in Greek. Andiliako. What about this? Coming from French as well. Microbe in Greek. Microvio. Huh? Microvio. And here, if we have time and if the audience allows it, allows it, we can also teach the endings of the words. Neuter endings, feminine, masculine endings. What about this? Mono, monopolio is the Greek word. And it means soul trade. Huh? Soul trade. It's not poly. Many people are confused with poly, soul city, but it is not from poly, it is from pulo, polo in Old Greek. Do you recognize this band? <laughs> Metallica, huh? from metallo. Metallica actually exists as a word in Greek and it is the adjective metallic. Another band. Uh huh. Good. Genesis. Mm, because the G becomes gamma in modern Greek. Genesis. And from Genesis, I'll take you to <laughs> Apocalypse. <laughs> Identical with the English word Apocalypse. And now we are towards the end Apocalypse. Let's also check the house. <laughs> Do we have French people among us? Okay, you recognize the newspaper. Uh, it's the first page of the Liberation paper uh, back in 2011 when Greece was again at the, ends of the, at the edge of the catastrophe. <laughs> and the French friends decided to use this word in, the <laughs> in their frontal page. No need to, to guess the Greek word, it is there for you. Chaos. What is this? Uh, it's a bank, it's the uh, brand name of a bank, Alpha. And I use it to end this presentation and take you from Alpha. In English you say from A to Z. What would the Greek people say? Apo to Alpha, sto? Omega, that's another brand, <laughs> it makes watches. Apo to alpha, sto omega. What do you think then? Was it really all Greek to you? Ευχαριστώ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I left time for questions. Sorry if I wasted all the time. Yes, please. Uh, you said IKEA means house. Did you know that it comes from the names of the producers? Yeah, I have heard that it comes from the names of the producers, but it's a good coincidence to be used in the language name. So it is an acronym, right? Mm. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good coincidence though, isn't it? <laughs> yes? I have the one question. These are all lessons for uh, students. Uh, I mean, this is all for adults. But how do you teach uh, Greek to 
to children learning Greek as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the associations? That's what's interesting. We can use many of those words for children as well, huh? from maths, from history. They know these words if they go to school. In yes, but you cannot uh, tell them, so these are labials, these are dental. No. So how, what do you do then? Then we, we present them uh, actively. We, we have them repeat the sounds. The sounds here, the sounds back. Okay. Hmm? Groups, friends. Photos, actually. Mm -hmm. make photos out of sounds. Exactly. Actually, with children, I think it would be easier because children are more eager to repeat and to pronounce the correct pronunciation than adults. Yes. But there are ways, yeah, not using the terminology at all, but uh, instead saying that these are friends or roommates. They live in the same area of the house. Yes? Thank you. In the very beginning, yes, yeah, we we do use some English in the beginning. It's not a prerequisite. We have had uh, Arabs, we have had Russian people who don't speak um, uh, English, but usually everyone or, or most of them speak some English, and they find it more helpful. But we have done it without uh, interference language at all. In Greek, yeah, yeah, right from the beginning, yes. Usually adults want to feel secure, uh, that they understand, that they understood correctly, so they need an interference language in the beginning. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are some fees, but they are lo low cost fees. A lot less than it would be in some private institution. I know that, for instance, people from Cyprus say the N, final N, <coughs> more than other people. Mm -hmm. How fussy are Greeks about that N? Because often you hear the instead of then, and you hear a neutron instead of a neutron. Mm -hmm. How f uh, do people care about that in or do they say it just as it pleases them to say it or not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a phonetical rule of when to use it and when not. <laughs> Does anyone know the, the, the rule for the final me? It has to do with what follows next, mm, what is the next sound. And if it is kuputu, bugudu, ksupsu tsuzu, or a vowel sound, then you have to use it. Okay, otherwise you omit it. Uh, but to be honest, Greek people don't really care about this. <laughs> and it may be dialectical or even idiosyncratic. Some people always pronounce it and some never. Yeah. Yes? When I was in Romania, I was learning Romanian, and these class, uh, classes were not useful for me. Mm -hmm. So, what is the, how how much is your are your classes successful, according to your students? You have what to, you have to ask someone else then. Uh -huh, <laughs> you have to come and see. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah. that's because we 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 learn nothing really there in Romania why? Why because they were all the time talking. So what can you do in Romania? What uh, what interests you during that Erasmus classes? So I'm wondering. What are is anything different in Greece? Mm -hmm. Well, we teach 40 hours of intensive compact lessons of Greek to them, and of course they cannot communicate fluently after that, but they know the basic stuff to unlock the language if they wish to on their own. And do they have to follow classes? It's not necessary, no, but once they they come to our classes, then they have to be there. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, that was that one was for beginners, but there are all all levels. Yeah, uh, up to C two. Very easy question for you. In the examples, you didn't say what kinikos meant. Kinikos, huh? But I just. Okay. Anyone who has who has the answer? Kinikos. Kinikos. No, if you see it written, it, it will come to you. 
cynical, cynical, <laughs> from the word kion, dog, that's the old word for dog. Do you know who was the first cynical? Was that, yeah? Diogenes, <laughs> Diogenes. He was Diogenes, the philosopher, whom the people in ancient Athens, Athens used to call him a dog because they, they didn't like him at all. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time.